Dotted all over the country, airfields are part of the fabric of Britain. An ambitious plan to build an ever-increasing number of houses has created a planning framework that now threatens the continued existence of airfield sites. The loss of airfields alone is not just a concern for those in the industry, but the knock-on social and economic impact in the areas surrounding the sites can be vast. The ongoing need for housing and the desire to keep airfields open are both equally complex issues. But for those closely dependent on the sites, the loss of an airfield can be particularly problematic. As the situation continues to evolve, I've spoken to a number of industry stakeholders about this issue and asked what this means for the general public as well as the aviation industry. Now I've been a private pilot for a couple of years now and that means I can fly those small single engine aircraft that fly around the sky on a Sunday afternoon and my type of flying forms what's called general aviation and the closure of airfields heavily impacts this industry. I spoke to John Gilder, the Vice Chairman of the General Aviation Awareness Council and he explains what general aviation is. Well, general aviation is everything but commercial aviation and military aviation. It's light aviation. It's a broad church ranging from powered single-engined aircraft, even twin-engined aircraft, through helicopters, through to microlights, gliders, balloons, these days as well, unmanned aerial vehicles. Flight training is one of the most popular activities that goes on at airfields up and down the country. The reason it's so important is that all pilots have to start somewhere. It doesn't matter if they end up flying airliners, they still have to learn to fly the small aeroplanes that fly from these airfields. With reducing numbers of airfields, the capacity flight training provides will also reduce. John Gilder says that the UK is one of the best places to learn to fly. All worlds are open because the, the training environment in the UK is pretty much second to none. We can manage four seasons in a day. One of the international languages of the air is English. And um, so there's a, a very good training environment uh, for anyone. The principal problem facing airfields is that they're classified as what's called brownfield sites. And this makes it easier for developers to obtain planning permission to build on them. John says this classification makes them particularly vulnerable when developers come looking for sites to build houses. The protection in the meantime for airfields as a whole has really not been there in the planning legislation. There's been an acknowledgement that they exist, but not specific protection. And what you've got from that is an uneven playing field. It makes them an easier target than many other types of use. That attracts developers because it's an easier project to get through. Most airfields across the country are run as commercial businesses. An airfield is an incredibly difficult and not entirely profitable venture to pursue. There are high fixed costs associated with running an operation, and a bad winter could leave the airfield without revenue for months. That's why for many owners, the thought of cashing in and selling to a housing developer is a tempting one. Anne Bartaby is the former chief executive officer of Red Hill Aerodrome in Surrey, and she's now one of the directors of the Airfield Operators Group an organisation which gets airfield operators together to share information and campaign as a unified voice. She explains that valuation differences can be vast. The most recent valuation on Red Hill Aerodrome as an aerodrome is about £12 million. Red Hill Aerodrome is nearly 500 acres and an acre of land which, with the benefit of planning permission, would be three million quid an acre. Now it's quite easy to see why airfields are targets for developers. A bad winter can kill revenues, and with the valuation as a property development being so astronomically different to that of an airfield, owners who have lost their appetite for operating an airfield could look to make an exit. If the owner says to the local authority, we're not making much money out of this, and we are a brownfield site, therefore we should get housing, it will take them a number of years, it will cost them quite a lot of money to promote that, but with the riches at the end of the rainbow, a lot of people are prepared to do that. Local authorities, particularly in some areas, are struggling to find sites for housing. So it is possible, and quite a lot of airfields have now been built on. 
airfields aren't just for pilots, they also attract many different groups to visit the facilities on site. For many airfields, a cafe is one of the common ways they bring people in from the local community. Some also have museums and other attractions. They also attract a different kind of visitor, as John Gilder explains. And what you'll find on many airfields is that there's thriving wildlife. For instance, birds and uh, the like in hedgerows. One of the airfields I fly from, we get a lot of butterflies at the right time of year, flying all over the place. It's extraordinary. You're in a cloud of butterflies as you're taxiing out onto the runway. And another airfield I fly from, we actually get deer roaming across the, the field. And on occasion, the odd hare turns out. In fact, they, they turn up early in the morning before flying starts and then reappear when flying finishes. So we integrate with nature and with wildlife uh, very well. So what has been done to stop airfields closing? And what could be done in the future to shift the direction of travel towards protecting the sites? Well, the all-party parliamentary group for general aviation is fighting the corner for airfields. It even has a working group focused on the issue. Lord Byron Davies is the co-chair of the group. You know, so what we're there to, and the subgroups there, to, to, to try and sort of uh, argue against that and try and work with government to come up with some reasonable planning alternatives where we can retain these airfields, if that all makes sense to you. Yeah, of course. And how much success have you had? Um, we've had well, we've had we've had quite a bit of success actually. Um, I mean, Grant, when he was chair of the APPG, um, managed to get some planning changes. I'll give you an example. One that comes to mind immediately is the the church bells, where you know if you've got noisy church bells, you could actually uh, take an action, you know, or get the local authority to to ban the church bells during the week or what have you from being rung, or indeed on a Sunday. Mm. Um, and then of course that all changed. The planning rules that were brought in to to stop that from being the case, if you moved into a, a property and the church bells had been there for many, many years ringing away, then you couldn't do anything about it. Well, we've managed to do the same thing with airfields. You know, if you move into an area now uh, next to an airfield, you can't sort of object to the airfield simply because uh, of the noise and the fact you don't like it. I mean, if it's been there and it's established, then, then um, it's uh, rather tough luck. The other side of the argument, of course, is that there is a definite need for housing to be built. A report for the House of Commons suggested that more than 300,000 homes need to be built each year in England to keep up with demand. In 2015, the government set an ambitious target to deliver 1 million net additions to the housing stock by the end of the Parliament in 2020. Upon being re-elected in 2017, the Conservative government recommitted to this target. John Gilder says that airfields, however, are in reality not the best choice for housing developments. We, we do need more housing. That's not contested. What we have to look at then is what type of housing is required and who are the people with a real requirement. The section of the community that is most under pressure are the people in the vocational groups of work. Their priorities are quite simple. They need somewhere they can afford to run. They need somewhere that is relatively close to their work, has the benefit of good um, communications, an easy and a relatively cheap commute. If you look at it, moving someone to an airfield 30 miles away from central London means that they probably want to buy two cars which they can't afford. They're in probably a three or a four bedroom house because they're the profitable ones for the developer, which they can't afford to run. Building on sites 30 miles from centres of employment really doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't address the problem in the right way. It's not just civil aerodromes that are under threat. The Ministry of Defence is looking to sell off a number of RAF sites to developers, as Lord Davies explains. I, I feel very strongly about quite a few of these, particularly the uh, the military ones, which um, the government or the MOD is looking at disposing of for building on. Uh, you know, you you'll never get a better airfield than a than a, than a mil an ex-military airfield in terms of uh, the way it's built, the 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 sort of infrastructure in terms of the the runways and what have you. And I think it's just a crying shame to just dig all those up and build houses. And I realise, I fully recognise the need for housing. Despite this, airfields continue to close each year. Every time one does, jobs are lost and the social impact of losing the sites hits the community surrounding it hard. The majority of airfields have been around since the war and every time one closes, a piece of fabric of the country is lost too. It's also the case that once they're gone, they're never coming back. And now on top of all of this, they're having to fight an entirely new battle.
This afternoon, the Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab, who is deputising for the Prime Minister, said the lockdown across the UK will remain in place for now. He said deaths are still rising and we haven't yet reached the peak of the virus. Coronavirus, which has swept across the world, is having a huge impact on airfields and it's compounding the threat that already exists to them. The outlook, of course, for them and the rest of the aviation industry is quite grim. Every day this week, I've had um, Skype and um, telephone calls with various companies that are absolutely looking at going under, in fact, uh, because of the effect of uh, coronavirus. And not just that, I'm talking about some of our major airfields as well, uh, that the big, you know, the big boys operate out of. Uh, and I was talking with one of our major airlines this afternoon. It's going, to, it's going to have a dramatic effect, I think. And, you know, we can't, we can't expect government to, to support everything uh, because at the end of the day, government money is, is our money. And there are, I, I think we'll see an awful lot of uh, flying schools not coming out of this successfully. And I think some of the, some of the, some of the bigger airfields as well will have difficulty uh, coming out of it. It's, it's had an enormous effect. It's huge. With this added complication, the threat to airfields has never been higher. The future for general aviation, flight training and the airfields that they use has just become a little bit more uncertain.